Before we start, I wish to say that when I'm reading and seeing the news about the war on Libya, it reminds me so much of what the United States and NATO did to Yugoslavia in 1999, just one of the wars it carried out against that country. I was in Yugoslavia with Ramsey Clark for several days twice uh, during the war. And in the United States, the media was so demonizing of the government of Yugoslavia, of the people really by extension, and the news coverage was outrageous. You didn't see the, what the damage and death that the NATO bombing did to that country. And I think it's the very same with Libya. And we're, that's why we're so fortunate to have Cynthia with us. The other is that that war began on March 24th, 1999. And it ended on June 5th, after 78 days. And every day on CNN, literally, because I recorded every day, CNN said, starting with the news, today's bombing was the heaviest ever. And the bombing against Libya is escalating every day. And they reported that yesterday, 19 civilians were murdered, in addition to the 700 estimated who've been killed so far. And the war is not over. That's why it's so important to hear from Cynthia tonight. Um, this bombing began on March 19th, and I see so many parallels between the two. For being here this evening, um, I uh, really don't, I hardly know where to begin. <laughs> it is really good for me to be back in California. I, I, um, I really shouldn't say that because I might be running for office from Georgia. <laughs> but I tell you, the, um, the people in California are uh, very special because uh, I feel as if there's so many kindred spirits here. I don't feel alone. And I see so many faces that I recognize. It's just wonderful to be back in California. I want to thank the Unitarian Universalist Church for hosting this event. Um, and uh, this is my first visit to the San Francisco Church. I've been to the Berkeley Church, but um, this is my first visit here. And I want to say a huge word of thanks to Answer because um, Answer heard my plea, really. I uh, was so outraged at what was happening that I decided that it wasn't sufficient for me to go by myself, that really what was needed was that a delegation of alternative journalists go to Libya and see for themselves and then report back through their respective news outlets or media organs just exactly what they saw. So um, I convinced a friend to basically loan me the money to send myself and I think six or seven other people to go and so it's about $25,000 and uh, so I um, needed to pay him back and so Answer said we'll do this tour and we'll help you raise the money to pay that loan back and I just have to say thank you to Answer for being here and just stepping up like that. Now, I um, also feel a little bit like uh, uh, I'm out of the fire in, into the frying pan because I left depleted uranium and I come to cesium and iodine. <laughs> and our government is doing nothing to even help us, to inform us, 
to tell us what we need to do to protect ourselves from the hot dust particles that we're breathing. And we now have another nuclear power plant on the brink in Nebraska. And of course, there's a, new, there's a news media blackout. Now, the news media blackout that we're experiencing with the implications for ourselves and our health around Fukushima is exactly the same kind of nuclear blackout that we are also experiencing with respect to what our tax dollars are doing to the people in Libya. And the news media, really, I don't know what they do. <laughs> Because we have more news outlets and we have less information. They sit over there and there's a whole, I've been at that hotel where they are and there's a bunch of them there. And yet they do nothing except accept the Pentagon's talking points for the day and then regurgitate that to all of us and any one of us who thinks that we are informed because we listen to CNN or Fox or CBS or NBC or ABC, I'm telling you that we are not informed. We are misinformed. We are the victims of disinformation. So after watching all of this, I just decided to go. And I can't tell you anything other than I saw what the International Solidarity Movement did with Palestine, where the young people who were founders of that organization decided that they were going to do what Mario Savio said to do that they were going to put their entire bodies against the gears, the levers, and the wheels of the machine, and they were going to say to the owners of the machine, either you're going to, either we're going to, st you're stop it, or we're going to stop it. And so, they did. And the International Solidarity Movement made a difference. At least, they raised the awareness of average ordinary folks, that average ordinary folks can do things to express their dissatisfaction, their disagreement with whatever U.S. policy is. And so um, I had worked up closely with the founder of the International Solidarity Movement in the Free Gaza Movement. And basically what Free Gaza was about was putting ourselves in that position so that we could understand better what was happening and defend the rights of those who can't defend their rights themselves. So, so um, I decided to go. Now there are some people in this room who have been to Libya with me. And uh, one is Troy Buckner that I see here. Uh, Troy Nkrumah, I have to call you your passport name. <laughs> and uh, Minister JR has been on the Dignity Delegations with me. Now there are people who have experienced history with Libya. I don't have that. Um, but what I do have is the opportunity that was given to me to bring delegations to Libya to participate in various conferences. The first conference was about the form of governance that Muammar Gaddafi uh, propounded by the Green Book. And this was the formation of revolutionary committees so that everyone would have an opportunity to have input into the decisions that were made on a national level. National policy decisions, everyone would have an opportunity for input. Now, of course, at the behest of the United States, 
the uh, Green Book was veered away from. But Senator Mike Gravel had been to, to uh, Libya because he is a proponent of direct democracy and what the Green Book provides is a blueprint for direct democracy. And Senator Gravel endorsed the uh, Green Book. So it was an opportunity, that first conference was an opportunity for us to learn about direct democracy as envisioned through the Green Book. The Green Book is available on the internet for everyone to read and I would recommend that you do read it so that you could understand a little bit more why the United States objected so uh, veros vociferously to um, the kind of governance that Libya had. Um, the second conference that I was allowed to take a delegation of people to was an Afro-Descendants conference. And uh, that conference brought together people on the continent and people in the diaspora. The objective was if the African Union was going to move very slowly on this idea of the United States of Africa, then maybe the push that was needed would be provided by people who are in the diaspora as well as grassroots Africans. And so people from all over the world of African descent were there in Tripoli and it was the first time that I had seen kings and queens and princesses from Africa that, that and the whole history and the lineage. I was totally unaware of the history and the presence and the importance of these particular personalities and they were all of course there um, supporting the idea of the United States of Africa. Now United States of Africa is also very important um, to uh, also understand why it is that the United States and the NATO countries <coughs> are so much against the leadership of Muammar Gaddafi and uh, the leadership that Libya provides. One of the things that I learned, and one of the lines that you might have heard in the special interest press is this idea that Muammar Gaddafi is not the president, he holds no leadership <coughs> role. I did learn on this last visit that Libya has a very real tribal system and actually it is the chief of all of the tribes who is the real leader and every Libyan national is a member of a tribe and so that Libyan national votes on the leadership of the country through the tribal arrangement and I think I see Akbar coming yes I do so um, there is a different kind of democracy that exists in Libya and we have to be respectful of the different type of democracy that exists in Libya. So um, anyway, I go there and I just happen to have been there on the, the night that NATO announced that it was going to intensify its bombing. Now, what that meant was that they did 29, as we counted them, between 26 and 29 bombs or missiles in one night. But that was nothing compared to what came afterwards because on one night, uh, just a few days ago, there were 89 bombs or missiles launched in Tripoli alone. And when I say 89, can you imagine 89 bombs or missiles falling in San Francisco? Or 89 bombs or missiles falling in Oakland? And Tripoli is a city of one and a half million to two million people. 
So um, the people are under attack. The people are under assault. And there is no place that is safe. There is a suspicion that they are using, that NATO is using depleted uranium. And of course, NATO has used depleted uranium everywhere they have bombed or sent missiles in. So there is probably, we can speak with assuredness, that not only are they destroying the, the, the lives of the people that are affected immediately, but they are destroying generations to come who will be impacted by the presence of this uranium. Um, I uh, have a film here that will give you a little bit of flavor about how it's, what it's like to be there when these bombs are going off. I even feel it now. You talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome. And imagine our soldiers, if I have it, and I've only experienced it for about, what, two weeks. But every time there's a whiz, or a hiss, or a pop, or a boom, no matter what the origin is, you, you jump and you, you react to it. Imagine that every night. Imagine if you're in a hospital and they're bombing right next to the hospital, which they do. Imagine if you're a child and you're in school and they're bombing right next to the school. Imagine if you're taking exams, you're a university student, and you're in the middle of exams, and they bomb your university. This is the kind of thing that's happening in Tripoli. It has nothing to do with the humanitarian intervention. They're creating a humanitarian crisis. before either we let um, Akbar come, because I think it's important. What Akbar brings is the historical context. There are many people who say that, um, who criticize the support that we give, not just for the Libyan people, but for Muammar Gaddafi. But as an African American, I can... As an African American, what I can say to you is that whether it was the Black Panther Party, or it was SNCC, or it was the All African People's Revolutionary Party, when black people were fighting the oppression and apartheid conditions in this country, it was the Libyan people and Muammar Gaddafi who answered Whoa. it. on the block, but Akbar can talk about the concrete relationship that was built by black people who made it possible for me to sit in the Congress for 12 years and that relationship that was bolstered and supported out of Libya by Muammar Gaddafi. I just want to say that um, perhaps the most touching of all of the meetings that I did, of all the places that I went, um, probably the most touching for me was the family of the hanged black Libyan who was selected because of the color of his skin. The NATO allies, the people who our government has allied themselves with, used the cell phone of that soldier who was not, he was in civilian clothes at the time. And they called his brother. And they asked his brother if he was, uh, Hisham was his name, if he was a Libyan. And the brother said, yes, of course he's a Libyan. And uh, they didn't believe him, so the brother reiterated that yes, he's a Libyan, I'm a Libyan, yes, he's a Libyan. They announced that they have their brother. The next day, another brother was called from the soldiers from Hisham's cell phone. 
and the rebels announced to the family that we're going to kill your brother. Watch what we do to him on Al Jazeera. They recorded their torture of Hisham and they murdered Hisham and they hanged Hisham and as you saw there it was on Al Jazeera. Now I spoke to the mother, the two brothers, the sad fact is that blacks and if you go to the Tunisian side of the border, you will see the Africans who were there as guest workers. They are huddled in camps. Their families are suffering because they're not sending remittances back home. Blacks have been targeted. The blacks that I spoke to are afraid to walk the streets because they have been targeted. And there are these latent feelings that Colonel Gaddafi and the Libyan people, the tribal chiefs have worked very hard to eliminate this racism based on skin color.